Okay. Well, technical difficulties will sometimes happen. Amen. I'm going to have you guys open up to Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to look at um, and focus in this morning just at verses 22 through through 25. And uh, if we do have a little bit more time, which I don't think we will, we might kind of flow into chapter 6, but I doubt it. Amen? So um, I'm going to prepare that right now. So I want to read this, and we did look at last week the first part of this section where it did talk about the acts of the flesh or the works of the flesh. The idea is that our fallen nature is evident by our sin. Because we are sinners, these practices are evident. And we saw that long list last week. Do you guys remember that list? I'm going to not really want to delve into it. But we also know that because we are born again, that Paul tells us that there is also fruit of the Spirit. And the way he starts in verse 22. So let's stand and we're going to read from verse 22. Um, he starts with the transition word, but. Or it would be like saying, however. Right? So at verse 22, you see up on the screen, he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And he ends this verse saying, against such things there is no law. But those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires if we live by the spirit let us also keep in step with the spirit let us not become conceited provoking one another envying one another and then the chapter ends so let's pray uh, heavenly father we want to thank you again for uh, what i believe lord to be a very important um, idea uh, about the christian life found here in these last verses of chapter 5, and I find them to be comforting uh, in light of what we saw last week as a contrast, and that is the uh, works or the acts of the flesh. We saw last week that they lead to sin, and we know, Lord, according to your word, that sin leads to death and destruction, and so, Father, we ended, uh, hopefully, Lord, uh, on a high note by also mentioning, however, the fruit of the Spirit is also uh, evident and manifested, Lord, but in the new nature uh, of those of us that know Christ as our Savior. So we thank you, Lord, that there is an option, that there are uh, choices that we can make as you enlighten us in your word as we understand your truth, we pray, Lord God, for faith to act, Lord, on what you have given us, uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to walk alongside us as Christians. And we're not alone. We don't have to try to figure this out. We know, Lord God, that you're with us. And we give you all the praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll have a seat. I'm going to say this. Um, we call this a close statement in education uh, where I'm going to leave like fill in the blank and it's a popular saying and see if we could uh, pay attention you guys I'm going to have you fill in the blank okay I'm going to say something and then I want you to end it for me okay as like father like oh wow how do you guys know that yes 
Now I'm going to add to it because I want to make it uh, fit our, our passage here. Like our heavenly father, like his redeemed sons. Huh. We are truly, according to the Bible, when we receive Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we are not only forgiven, but we are transformed. We're given a new nature. And uh, that is the promise of the Holy Spirit who would guide us and lead us, who would comfort us, who would walk alongside us, who would influence us and persuade us and convince us of justice, of what's right and wrong, who would draw us and closer to the Father, who would, being present in our life, produce fruit. So that's what we're going to look at here. The fruit of the Spirit uh, sums up eight attributes of, the, uh, of a person or a community that's living in accord with the Holy Spirit. And someone might say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. Um, there's nine. Okay, well, let's, let me count here. Love, one, joy, two, peace, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's nine. You, you can't count, Pastor. <laughs> uh, yes, I can. Uh, I've come to understand, and I want you to hear this part because this whole sermon is prefaced on knowing this. We, we, uh, we, we have to come to understand, as I have come to understand, that no other part of the fruit, okay, I, I'll, I'll say it this time, fruits, but it doesn't say, go back to 22, it doesn't say fruits. It says fruit. So I'm going to say there's no other part of the fruits, that's not what it says, but I'm going to use it for a moment, uh, 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 of the Spirit can develop without the presence of love. Okay, so I'm going to suggest to you that it's fruit of the Spirit, not fruits, and so none of the others, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control, I'm, I'm going to suggest to you that they cannot develop without love. So it is the fruit of the Spirit, it is love. Okay, that, that's my argument this morning. I want you to notice, see the Greek word means fruit of the Spirit, not fruits. Okay, the Greek word is karpos, which is singular. Okay, meaning fruit, like one, right? Not many fruits, or not even different kinds of fruits. So what it means when we begin to read what the fruit of the Spirit is, Paul's not trying to tell us that there's different kinds of fruits that the Spirit gives. Instead, he's describing different characteristic of the grace that's present because of the Holy Spirit that is working in us. He's telling us that when the Spirit is present in our lives, love is present. Now, therefore, and I know you're going to probably run and go listen to maybe one of your favorite pastors or look in your commentary. Not a lot of pastors or commentaries spend a lot of time developing this. But I want you to see there is the fruit, no S, of the Spirit is love. And then we we'll put a semicolon. Stop. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And here's my position, okay? Everything else, what is everything else? Well, we saw it. Follows love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All those are simply a byproduct of love, okay? Or, and they say it this way. Uh, and not that I'm trying to rewrite the Bible, but I'm trying to explain it. We have to remember, those of us that actually study other languages know that it's almost impossible to, co to literally translate the very same thing, word for word per se, because of the differences in languages, or maybe the mistranslation in that, or misunderstanding, because it does say fruit, not fruits. So let me say this. Another way we could say this 
if you have love, you have joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So do you guys understand where I'm leading here? Everything else is a byproduct of it. A consequence of the presence of the Holy Spirit means that there's the presence of God's love in your heart. And I'm going to prove that with other verses right now, but I want you to understand. Another way we can say it, and you say, Pastor, you keep trying to like explain it. Exactly. <laughs> Another way we can say it, because I, this is where I really love teaching God's Word. How can I say this in a way that's simpler or in a way which opens your eyes and your mind to see how important it is to understand what the Holy Spirit is trying to teach us? So not only if I can say if you have love, you have these other attributes, you can say love is defined by joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Okay? So fruit, now that we got that out of the way, let me say something about fruit. Fruit is a natural outgrowth of a tree who's rooted on healthy soil. So if a tree or any other plant that produces fruit, if it's planted in unhealthy soil and receives adequate sun and water and the nutrients from the soil, it will, by natural process, what? Outgrow. It will, I don't have to go to an orange tree and shake it if these conditions are present, healthy, sunlight, water, soil. I don't have to go to it and shake it and say, I want you to produce oranges. It will, as a natural consequence. Because... Of that, I can say in a spiritual sense that fruit of the Spirit is a natural outgrowth of God's nature or character. Okay? Like Father, like Son. Okay? So when Paul, what he's doing here, he's showing us that the, the Spirit is truly in us, if it is the Holy Spirit, then we should see evidence through the fruit of the Spirit, which is described by, we said it again, joy, love, peace, patience, et cetera, et cetera, right? Not one of the characteristics is present, not two of them, but all of them are present in the life of the Christian as evidence of what? Of the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. And you know what got us into this relationship anyway? For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. We love him because he first loved us. We don't even get into a relationship. We can't even begin to accept Christ or know Christ except for his act of love, his evidence that he loved us when he went to Calvary's cross and sacrificed himself for us. We walk into this relationship through the front door with that one basic understanding. This the whole thing starts out of love. How can it not be like heavenly father, like redeemed earthly sons and daughters. It's just not possible in the, in the spiritual realm to not be true. Because it's true in the physical realm, in the material world, right? So it's something that Timothy Keller says, he's a pastor in New York City, there's a big church over there, a really good author. He says, the real fruit of the Spirit always grow up together. They are one. So all of these characteristics that we see that flow from love, they're all there at the same time, and they grow together. It's not like one of them is present. Hey, I have a whole lot of gentleness in my life, but I have no self-control. Well, then you're contradicting yourself because self-control is gentleness. Right? I just think it's funny that he, he's talking about fruit. 
Now, we can observe fruit uh, if we happen to study some, a little bit of agriculture. We're farmers, maybe. Uh, and we know that it doesn't always all appear at once. Now, I will say something about the development of fruit is that it must grow. We know that much, right? It must, fruit must mature. I always go uh, a Trader Joe's or Stater Brothers, wherever I decide to go shopping. I like to buy bananas, and I buy them green. Anybody know why? Because if I buy them already mature, by the time I get to the sixth one, it's rotten. Because I'll eat one a morning. So I kind of buy them when they're greenish, you know. And what I do observe is they mature. It is impossible for fruit not to grow or mature. We see it on a, an, on a tree. It, uh, oranges, because we live in Southern California and out in Marino Valley where I was raised uh, pretty much, uh, I noticed that during the spring, it would be a beautiful aroma in the valley. It smelled like orange blossoms. It's just a little tiny plant, a little tiny flower initially. But what eventually happens? It grows into an orange. Amen? So, let's say this. Uh, uh, fruit must mature. Fruit must grow. The same is true for the fruit of the spirit and the life of the Christian, there is a growth process and there are seasons for it to grow. And we may sometimes look at someone in the Christian family and say, man, it's taking you a long time for your fruit to grow, <laughs> right? But that's sometimes the case. Therefore, there, we have babes in Christ and we also have those in Christ who are not drinking milk but are eating meat. So let's, let's understand there's a growth process. Uh, and um, uh, the thing, though, is that fruit grows, uh, whether some of it may grow faster than others, not the issue here. The fact of the matter is that it grows and it should grow. And if it's not growing, then it's not healthy. And if there, are not, and if there is not evidence of these characteristics of love, which is the fruit of the Spirit in the Christian life, then we have to ask ourselves the question, what's wrong with the tree? What's wrong with the Christian? Amen? So let's look at love for a minute. That's, that's the fruit of the Spirit. Love. Well, I tell you, this is a institution that is Christianity Established by the Lord Jesus Christ, but what a way to start it. Its foundation is love. I can look at a lot of other institutions, especially man-made ones, and I can tell you right now, they're not based on love. They're usually based more so, not always, on the works of the flesh on the acts or the practices of the fallen nature of man. So let's look at love. The word is agape. If you go into a concordance and you look at this word in Greek from Galatians chapter 5, you'll find the word agape. And it's a verb. So what does a verb indicate to us, guys? Action. Love cannot be static. Love cannot be poetic. It not, can't just be something I assent to, something I think of, something I feel or believe. It's action. It must be seen at work. It must be evidenced in your practices, in your lifestyle, and how you live. It's a verb from the form agapao. So agapao is a verb. Love is, comes from the noun agape. Okay? So, just so you know, Greek is very precise. Koine Greek is just the language of the New Testament, uh, although there are some portions of the New Testament that may have been written, been written in Aramaic. However, this verb is very precise. It's not like English, because we can love, and we use one word, like, for instance, I love pizza. And I really love pizza with pepperoni. But I also love my son, Sammy. And we just say, okay, it's acceptable in English, but it would never would be, you would never say, you agapao pizza in Greek. 
right? You can't love pizza the same way you love someone in a cherished relationship. So it's very precise. Let me just tell you so you have a little bit of understanding. There's several words for love. There's the word phileo. How many of us have heard of phileo? It's like Philadelphia. Philadelphia is brotherly love. Phileo, Delphia, brother. Brotherly love, right? It refer, there's another word in the, in the Greek that refers to erotic love, which is a love of lust, which is eros, E-R-O-S. There's another word uh, as storge, S-T-O-R-G-E, which is a love between family members. There is a difference between paternal love, which is brotherly love, phileo, and sorge, which is family love. There's a little difference. Amen? So the Bible, when it mentions these words, It's trying to give us a very clear, especially the Greek, and I find it fascinating if you want to get a little bit deeper into uh, scripture study and Bible study, that God would have allowed the Bible to have been written in probably the most precise language in history, Greek, Koine Greek to be specific. Agape love is a little bit different than phileo, it's a little bit different than eros, and a little bit different as storge. It is... Not a feeling. It's a motivation for action. Get this. We choose freely or reject. So, it requires the free will. See, this is why I find it fascinating what happened in the fall in Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. God put them in a perfect paradise. God put them in a place where every one of their needs could be met. As one command. You guys know what it was, right? Don't touch. Don't eat, rather, n- n- I, take, I, st- I take a step back. He didn't say nothing about touching. He said, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's it. How many trees might have been in the Garden of Eden. Thousands, hundreds of thousands. If we go through all the earth today, there's in hundreds of thousands of trees, if not more, which are a product of the Garden of Eden, of the original creation. So they were told not to touch one of them. Why would he leave them open to that option of choosing? Because you cannot have love without free will. Otherwise, they would just be robots following the commands of software that's ingrained in their DNA. Do you understand where where we're going here? Love is impossible without free will because if I forced someone to love me, What would that be? Coercion, not real, it would be fake. And if you took it to its extreme, it would be violent. If a man forces himself on a woman that doesn't desire him, what's that called? (laughs) Okay, do you see the contrast that opens up with free will? We choose. Love now, our because someone might say, Well, Pastor, I feel love. Well, that's good that you do, and thank God that that's a byproduct that you can have these wonderful feelings in the state of love. But love is a decision, according to the Greek agape, it's a verb, right? And it's motivated, it moves you. It influences you to do things you, could, you would never imagine you would have done for the object loved. Guys and girls and moms and dads and friends, we do things for others that are automatic and natural and, and, and they can feel good, but above and beyond, it's amazing what love can promote and what love can do, isn't it? 
never forgetting the greatest example of love was demonstrated by Christ on Calvary's cross where he died for those that were not deserving of it. That's love. Now, I'm going to get a little bit more into it as far as love is concerned, but I want to stress that it's not a feeling, it's motivated for action, and that we are free to choose and or to what? Reject. Right? Notice that free will is required. So let me read to you from Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2. It says, therefore, and this is trying to understand agape through the love of Christ and his example, right? If I want to see what love looks like, well, let's look at Christ, which is what he demonstrated at the cross so that we understand agape Therefore, be imitators of God. Notice, like God, like sons. Be imitators, or I could easily say, be like God. Copy God. Imitators, right? As beloved children. Notice the emphasis is that we're already in a relationship of love. And walk in love. So if you're in a relationship with God in love and because of love, therefore walk in love, and then he's uses Christ as the ultimate example, as Christ loved us, and then he describes the action that Christ uh, performed to prove an evidence. This is evidence-based research here. And he what? As Christ loved us, and he gave himself for us, he sacrificed himself for us, he sacrificed himself for us on the cross, he suffered for us, and this is a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. When God saw that, he ex- fragrant. What do we do with a fragrant? I was over at, uh, uh, was it um, the other day at the mall? I was going to say Nordstrom's, but they're closed. The other fancy one over there in Riverside. <laughs> and I was going through the section where the men's cologne was, and there I was smelling all of them. What is it? Fragrant that smells well. What 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 are we saying when we inhale it and that we're accepting it, that it's pleasant to us? The sacrifice of Jesus was accepted by the Father on our behalf, and it's a fragrant to him, in that by accepting his sacrifice of love. Those of us that come to Christ are are found in Christ through faith are also accepted as the Son is accepted. We are accepted in the beloved. We can never be accepted before God or have right standing with God outside of Christ. It is through Christ and His righteousness which is accredited to us through faith when we accept His sacrifice on the cross that the Father accepts us. Literally, That the Father smells us and says, that one's okay. Sounds a little crude, doesn't it? But it goes into Old Testament sacrificial practices. And if you understood how they worked in the Old Testament, that God would withhold His wrath and His punishment because a payment was made on behalf of the guilty, then you would understand what Jesus did for us is much more because of who it was that went to Calvary's cross and why. So agape is sacrificial love, according to Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. And it was voluntary. Remember when Jesus was suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane, and we hear and read uh, from the the Gospels that the stress was so um, heightened in that Jesus understood what was waiting for him. He's the only man who knew how he would die and 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 what manner he would die, the cruelty of it and the suffering of it, and he he wrestled with the flesh, and he said there in Gethsemane that uh, as he wrestled, the tears of blood came from his forehead, and uh, uh, he was hemorrhaging literally uh, over the idea of understanding what he would go through for the uh, to sacrifice himself for the sins of the world, and he said, Father. Uh, the flesh is weak. Yes, of course it's weak. He was a man. But the spirit is willing. And he, and he was, I, 
I believe in, in some way as a, in his humanity saying, hey, Lord, I understand plan A, that is the cross, but is there, is there a possibility that there's a plan B and I don't have to go through this? And he said, nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. And he went straight to the cross when they called out his name with Judas coming to betray him with the soldiers and with the high priest. And he stood up when he had been praying and he didn't run down a creek or hide behind a tree or a boulder, but he stood up and he said, I am Jesus of Nazareth. And he put out his arms like this and they handcuffed him and they took him away and why did he do such a thing because of love well, i'll get a little bit excited about love if you're going to get excited about something you better get excited about his love because it'll change your life and we need a little bit of changing in this world today we need a revival in america and why doesn't god start it right here with me i'm open i'll do it because the message is love. Jesus went to that cross on our behalf. And the greatest of exchanges took place. The innocent one went to the cross for the guilty. And if the guilty can be set free from condemnation and the wrath of God, and we become the righteousness of God through Christ, it's accredited to our account if we would only believe. So agape, this love that describes the sacrifice of Jesus and what motivated him, is, is, a, is a love that's voluntary. Because you know what? Agape kind of love cannot be invoked by command. God cannot force us to love him. Now, the greatest of commands in the Old Testament was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength as the law required and your neighbor as yourself. But you see how well that worked for Israel. That they would be taken into captivity at some point of their experience and history for their lack of obedience which ultimately is lack of love. And I'll get to that in a minute. You cannot invoke love as a command. You cannot change people by writing laws in the legislature. You can't even get people to wear masks by commandment. Why? It's our nature. We have to do it w with understanding. We have to do it with knowledge. We have to do it motivated by love. If that were what were actually going to benefit someone else, you would do it. Agape, or this love that's described as agape in the New Testament... It comes from God. It is not something that we can acquire on our own merits or efforts. It's a gift from God. And all you can do is receive it. Have you? That's all you can do. He gave you a choice, free will, to accept it or not. To reject it or accept it. Romans 5.5 5 says, And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You notice it's been poured into our hearts. What a grace. If it was poured into our hearts, it means it wasn't in our hearts in our fallen nature. So let me say a few things about love. I learned this from my pastor 40 years ago, and I have it written in an old Bible, and I actually went and opened that old Bible yesterday, and I found the notes on page 3. And I remember sitting in the pews, writing fast as I could. The writing's kind of sketchy, because I was trying to write fast as he was preaching, just like a lot of you are doing right now. Yeah, right. Agape love is selfless. 
meaning not selfish, to start off with. It's uncalculating. Oh, what do you mean by that? There is no record uh, of good or bad that it does. It doesn't keep count. Like on a balance sheet or a spreadsheet or your bank statement where it has credits and debits, agape love doesn't do that. Now, phileo does because it's a mutual love. You scratch my back, I scratch your back. You do for me, I do for you. The problem with phileo, which is a good concept, I mean, everybody wants to have, you know, their back scratched and then therefore, you know, you scratch back the back of the one who scratched your back. Don't ask me to repeat that. The problem with it is when the ledger becomes unbalanced, resentment moves in. Yeah? Well, I did this for you, and you didn't do that for me. Or look, you know what I'm saying? The problem with the leo, not that it's not desirable, and I'll tell you in a minute how you get there, but the problem is that you're constantly keeping record. And then you start to say, hey, this relationship here is not balanced. I did this for you on November 13th, 1959, and you haven't done anything back for me in, 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 in kind. So there's no record. There's no balance sheet. There's no calculating and saying, hey, you owe me. Which is ultimately, you never get what you're looking for because there's never going to be that balance in our fallen nature. But if you give sacrificially in the way of agape, <coughs> excuse me, you will then arrive at some place to where you also give back to the person that gave to you. Jesus expects nothing back from us. His sacrifice was unconditional. And the problem with human or phileo love, brotherly love, is it's conditional. Tell me it's not. And I can show you relationships that are strained. And I can show you why. When there is agape love, it's giving of yourself with no thought whatsoever of anything in return. But you give of yourself not on the basis of what you're going to receive in return, but you give because of the intrinsic value of the object you love. That's the love of Christ. Can you imagine if you kept a ledger of our debts and credits? I used to think false teaching, unfortunately, uh, growing up as a young man, I'd I recognize I didn't have the best Bible teachers. I used to think that your heart's like this canvas. And every time you sin, there's a little dot that's black dot that's put there to record your sin. And when you die, if you have more white or clear, clear clean canvas than, than a stained canvas, you get to go to heaven. Which is based on works, isn't it? No. Our salvation in our hearts and our sins are washed away, erased as far as east is from west by the precious blood of our loving Savior at Calvary's cross. And you get to go in with a clean bill. Yeah, agape love is giving of yourself without any thought of anything in return because of the value of the object you love it is uncalculating, there's no record kept, there's no balance sheet, there's no spreadsheet. It's selfless. It thinks not of itself. And that kind of love is magnetic, isn't it? It's drawing. It makes me want to go closer to it and know it more. 1 Corinthians 13, which is always read at weddings, but is not a wedding passage it's about ministry. It's about ministry, and it's about what we do as Christians amongst each other. Listen to what Paul says. I, I know you, you heard a lot of weddings, and it's okay to use it, but the, the context was not weddings and marriage. It was love amongst each other as the body of Christ. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, that is 
if I knew the heavenly language, would I not have a gift? But I don't have love. So you can speak all you want, even in the tongues of heaven. But if you don't have love, you're just noisy gonging a clanging cymbal. <laughs> wah, 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 blah, 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 blah. Right? Because you can have prophetic powers and you can know all the mysteries and all knowledge. This is powerful. I don't know if you've ever stopped to look at it. You would say, well, yeah, who? If someone had prophetic powers and understood all mysteries and had all knowledge, man, and, and then you had, and, and have all faith that you can remove mountains, but you don't have love, Paul says, I am nothing. Wow. Hmm? 1 Corinthians 13. You know, if I went around moving mountains and speaking mysteries to you, but I don't have love, I'm worthless as a pastor, according to the Lord. God help us. God help me. He, he also says, if I give away all I have, not the sum of what I have, if I give everything away that I have, if I were uh, Elon Musk and gave away my billions, you would think, wow, that guy's going to heaven. But if he, and then if he were to deliver up his body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Does it like all of a sudden begin to sink into us how important love is? Love is patient and kind. I think some of those are up there. Yeah. And does not envy or boast. Envy or boast. Uh, instead of being jealous of what you have, I celebrate what you have. And I'm not boastful of what I have. Just thankful that I have something worth boasting over by others and hopefully to be used to bless you. It's, it is not, uh, it's not arrogant or rude. Hello? <laughs> it's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. So the Christian can't say, uh, it's my way or the highway. See you, wouldn't want to be you. Hasta la vista, baby. None of that stuff is the kind of attitude that we would have as a Christian. It does not insist in his way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. It doesn't rejoice over sin. Wrongdoing. But rejoices with truth. And then I love the last part. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And then love never ends, but let me put it in there with the Greek, agape never ends, or let me put it even further, Christ's love never ends. And if that love lives in you, it never ends. You don't get tired of it. So when we look at the fruit of the Spirit, we know that it is love that makes all these other attributes possible as a byproduct couple other things, and I'll finish with this. Where am I here? Oh, I got time. In 1 John, uh, agape is mentioned the most, the, fir- the, go- the epistle of 1 John. And there are two important themes that come out of that, and uh, you can take a look at it later in your devotionals. The first is that it is inconsistent and false to claim that we have the love of God, agape, while not loving other believers or other people. You do not have, it's a false claim. It's inconsistent. I don't know the reasons for that. Maybe you didn't know, so now you do. Maybe you need someone to tell you to stop it, and now you do. Stop it. Right? Or maybe you just don't know God, and that could be a third reason. Hopefully that's not the case. We cannot love God without loving our brothers and sisters who also love him. Does that make sense? 
Second is that it's inconsistent and false to claim that we love God if we don't obey him. That's what 1 John tells us. It's impossible to love God while ignoring what he says. These two are found in 1 John. They're connected. Love is evidenced by our love for others, especially the body of Christ. But if you love the body of Christ, you're going to love also what Jesus said. And if you love the Lord enough to f- obey him, you'll also love your enemy. See, it takes it even further. So, it's important to know, as we saw already in Galatians 5, that for the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So, love of others and love of God are tied into getting along with each other, loving each other, caring for each other, and obeying God. You cannot say you love God if you do not obey Him. So, what, what's the point of the fruit of the Spirit? Well, I know one thing. Fruit doesn't exist for itself. Especially when I go to Stater Brothers. I've been on this Mandarin thing lately. You guys ever eat those? I eat them so much I get my tongue gets all raw. But boy, the vitamin C has been really good to keep me healthy from these viruses lately. Fruit exists for others. There's a whole agriculture economy that exists and they're waiting for one thing to happen that is for the fruit to reach a point of maturity so they can go pick it. But it's for others. We want the fruit many times in our lives to satisfy us so that we can be happy and fulfilled, but that's not the purpose of the fruit. The purpose of the fruit is to benefit others. So we should allow the fruit of the Spirit to flow from us to a, li- to a world that knows not Christ. The secret of bearing fruit. Let me just talk about this for a second. John 15, 4, write it down. You can look it up later. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. What does that mean, to abide? I'll say it real easy. What the Lord is saying here, Jesus wrote these words and spoke these words. He says, stay close to me. We stay close to Christ, we'll produce fruit. So here's the end of the sermon. If you consider this last part of Galatians 5, what does your life reflect as far as the works of the flesh or the fruit of the Spirit? That's the question. That's why it's brought up. We need to seek the Lord and confess if we've been living according to the flesh. You say, well, That's really easy to say, Pastor. No, it isn't, because that requires that we accept the truth about where we're living. If we're living in the flesh, then we need to confess that with the Lord. And we need to ask Him to fill us with His Spirit so that we can then be renewed and transformed. If there's going to be a change, you've got to get close to Christ. Remember the examples I gave you before. Gravity as a law of physical nature, of nature, so is the work of the Spirit in your life. It will transform you. While that gravity will drag you down, the Spirit will lift you up and edify you. Uh, we talked about radiation some weeks ago. It has an uh, impact on the, your cells. It can damage your cells and create cancer and kill you. And if you're exposed it to that uh, physical uh, element of radiation and which we can't see but the same is true uh, in the spiritual realm with spiritual laws if you are influenced uh, if you are impacted by the, the the holy spirit your life will reflect that too it's not a mystery so let's listen and this is what i suggested a couple of weeks ago i think as a church let's listen more carefully to the holy spirit Let's listen more carefully to his word through which the Holy Spirit works to help change us and bring us to truth. Let's submit 
or obey what he tells us. Uh, let's pray for a greater faith to act on the things that the Lord is revealing to us. And let's never stop praying for that grace that transforms us and helps us to grow and mature. Because as I mentioned, fruit, the last time I took a real close look at it, grows. May it be that for us also. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Uh, what an amazing chapter this was, and especially this idea of, your, of the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. Father, may Crosspoint have evidence of all the attributes that flow from knowing Christ and His love. May we be more like our Heavenly Father. May our light shine, if, to use another example, as it is reflected off of, Christ, or off of ourselves from Christ. May the light of Christ reflect off of our lives and be seen in a world that doesn't know you. We thank you, Lord. We know this is what you desire of us. So we pray, Lord God, now that we know, now that we have a better understanding, that we would seek you. Draw near to you, and you will draw near to us. And we thank you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.